my name is Sumandro. My nickname is Riju. Some people in this room would know me by my nickname, I guess. Um, I work at the Sarai program of this institute called the Center for the Study of Dev Center for the Study of Developing Societies. It's a research institute located in Civil Lines in Delhi. Um, my own work has largely to do with uh, how the government of India manages information, manages data. Uh, I'm interested in the history of it and the politics of it to a great extent. Also, the policy side uh, to some to some degree. Uh, the several things that I want to talk about, and I think I'm expected to talk about, but they might not be in the slides um, because I thought I, I should talk about very high-level things, perhaps, uh, in my core presentation, and then I can talk about details along with Satya Rupa later. Uh, thanks very much to IT for Change for the invitation, as well as for setting up this panel uh, after Prabhu's talk, because I think that was a great introduction to many of the things we would be talking about. Um, thanks to Satya Rupa for grounding the discussion uh, to a great deal. I was very, very afraid that mine would be too much flying in the air, and, and, and I begin. Uh, so to begin with, one of the issues that also Satya Rupa to some extent uh, addressed, I guess, is often it becomes very difficult to communicate with the state. So the thing that uh, Param also picked up, that the people want to be seen, people want to be heard, that again is a, often a very important uh, kind of emotion. That we feel that people, the, state are in, the state isn't talking to us, the state isn't listening to what we're telling it, and the state isn't talking to us either. Right, And here comes data, of course. And again, going back to Param's introduction, this is not a new thing. It may be happening through computers, through the digital right now. But the state has a long tradition um, of keeping track of things and people, so objects and people both. Right? Um, anybody uh, identifies what this image is showing? So it's a, uh, it's a room in uh, Sao Paulo, and it's the government of Sao Paulo's kind of a magical information room, which has been created by them by IBM. Um, and it's one of the first instances of creating a smart city, uh, a discourse that is also pretty much coming up uh, in our, in Rio, I'm so sorry, in Rio. In Rio de Janeiro. Thanks, Satya. Um, so a discourse that is also coming up in our country and something um, we would be talking about very soon, I guess. Um, so there's one, this kind of an imagination of data and governance and people and transparency that somehow the governance is suffering because the government is not, is not driven by accurate and representative data. And this is something Satya was building up the case for that the government still just doesn't have enough data to see the things they're saying and to do the things they claim they are, they are doing, right? The other imagination on the other, it's not, it's not exactly the other end of the spectrum, but at least the other uh, dominant imagination is that if people have uh, devices and networks and resources to produce, consume, and circulate a lot of data among themselves, not only about themselves, so the data is not only about themselves, but the data is also about the state, that leads to a large, open, transparent society. This uh, image is from uh, the Occupy Wall Street uh, movement in New York, the, the Occupy Wall Street movement in New York, rather, um, Zuccotti Park. Uh, so that's the other kind of dominant uh, idea about how data transparency, governance, people, social welfare are all linked together, right? Now I'll talk about two uh, major uh, concepts. One, that of big data. The other is of open data. And I'll end with three questions. Um, at the question level, I would try to kind of, again, uh, uh, propose ways of thinking uh, about big data and open data through gen gender. Uh, but, it, it, but the questions are very general. They can work uh, with other they can, they can uh, provoke other kind of um, concerns as well. So again, the images are provocative, uh, but they're not representative. So big data doesn't necessarily begin with this. 
Um, by this, I mean, does not necessarily begin with this particular image or this particular way of doing it, but big data must begin with a unique identifier. So the reason that, say, Google and Facebook would always call, ask you to give them your mobile number is not only because that adds to more previous, more security of your account, but also because they really would then know that whether you are a unique customer or not. Or also they, they can allow, uh, so they can take your identities and you take your different mobile numbers and put them together and whatnot, so let's not get into that. But the main idea is that when you're thinking about big data, big data is a lot of data that cannot be worked with, uh, I mean worked through with one computer. There, there are uh, kind of um, contesting definitions. I don't want to get into that. I, I just want to talk about the process of big data because I think that is really what brings out the uniqueness of big data as opposed to small data. So big data, by definition, since it's a lot of data, unique, unique identifiers for each person or each object who is included in that big data. Because the idea is that this each person and each object by using the unique identifier can be traced across the big database or can be traced across multiple big databases. So it begins with a unique identifier. Then comes the question of capture. Then there must be some systems put up that can capture data about this person or this object. So it can be Facebook, it can be Google, it can be a surveillance camera, um, all these things, right? Then comes, again I'm talking about materiality because that's really what I'm myself and my work excited about. Then comes the data warehouses. You need a whole lot of machine to actually hold this information and run analysis on top of it, right? For running analysis, you need to, you need to track each unit of data or each unit of data about one person across the various things that person is doing. And here the importance of unique identifier comes back. If you have questions, please ask me later. Um, then once you have analysis done, then you can take some real world um, decisions on base of that. The good thing is since you have, yes, you have such powerful machines running at the back, you can almost take decisions at the real time. So the way say Facebook can change the advertisement it is showing almost in real time, the fact that you were searching something else half an hour back can come back to haunt you in the form of advertisements after half an hour is because Facebook can crunch through all that data you have given it in that shorter period and come back with the results based upon that data. Now, as you can see, the same kind of an imagination of big data can work for cities as well. For example, so this is a, a screenshot from something uh, the MIT Sensible City Lab was doing as an experiment in Singapore. Uh, what it is doing is it's taking uh, location of taxi and whether it's uh, vacant or whether there it's occupied kind of data across several taxi companies in Singapore. And we're trying to plot where in Singapore right now there is vacant taxi, where in Singapore right now people are occupying taxis and so on. So see, if you have this kind of data, you can also say change uh, road signals accordingly so as to optimize movement of traffic and so on. So you can directly see why a concept like big data and big data based analytics would attract all kind of uh, managers. So managers of people as well as managers of objects. So logistics companies and so on. And I move to open data. I take a slight detour through free software, though that is necessarily not what open data is only about, right? Okay, so who knows about free software? So, sorry. I gave you the clue already. One, two, and three, and four, and five, and six, and seven, and eight, and nine, and ten. Right. So what are the, what are the freedoms associated with free software? Source, no cost. No cost. Not much cost. Give the, give the freedom so, to use the source code as you want to. Mm -hmm. Freedom to use the source 
You get the source code. You get the source code. So it's freedom to see the source code work and <coughs> and work on it and modify it. Yeah. Anything add to, add to that? Except the IT for change people, of course, the tech note. We are so embarrassed we are not adding it now, we are ready. <laughs> Anybody else? So we have, it's free of cost, or almost free of cost. Pros to being free of cost. Um, okay, CIS people and Wikipedia people out as well. And uh, then you get to see the source code, you get to uh, study the source code. Anybody else? Well, roughly that is it. So yeah, I'm, I'm, being, I'm being bad right now. Um, the point is you get to see the source code. You get to study the source code. You also get to create something else from it. So you can create derivatives. And you can share the derivative as well. Under license specified, under specific licenses, uh, which governs the first free software to begin with, because there are multiple forms of free software. So it's free software as in, so with free as in freedom. So you can do anything with it. It can also be, and often it is also free as in lunch. So it's, it comes without a monetary cost. It's free to study, as you said. It's free to use. And it's free to modify and share. So guess what open data should be about? So um, open data is about freedom. You're free to do things you want with that data. It can also be as in free lunch, or free as in free lunch, which is also generally how open data is. It's just up there on the internet. And as long as you can pay for data connection and a computer and so on, you're free to get the data and do anything with it. So open data should be about free to study. It should be about free to see, of course, before free to study. And you can modify, you can create things out of it, and you can share that too. So this in my sense, is what I would call open data. What it does is it open sources information. In India, we have a larger uh, connect with the idea of right to information, a larger experience of RTI. One thing that has been missing uh, in the demand for information, in the right for information, is often we are not sure on what data that information is based upon. Satya gave a gave great example that there is a, there's a document, there's a Chennai Climate Change Action Plan document, which you can see if it's not published or if it's not directly available in the public domain. You can file an RTI and you can get this document. But not necessarily what all data and background reports and particular input papers that information is based on. In many cases, having access to the information is already a great, wonderful tool to hold the state accountable. But in certain cases, you might also want to ask the state on the basis of what data that information has been created. For example, um, I, I, I did some bit of work on uh, water data, rainfall data. Now, the thing is that, uh, the, the data that IMD, uh, IMD is the Indian Meteorological Department, they collect about rainfall in India is in terms of, uh, in terms of so, so that data and what the data says is actually is in a complete disjunct disjuncture between how uh, drought districts are calculated by the district level administrators. So the question here is not only that having access to data will tell us whether the information is right or wrong, but it also tells us, to some extent, how information or how decisions within the government is taken. So it also throws a light between the, the traveling path of data within the government, which often is of great importance, uh, because that gives us, a, gives us a sense of how the government is functioning. So the fact that government is collecting data does not always mean that the government is acting upon the same data. Because collection of data and acting can be divided between different functionaries of the government. I mean, depending upon issues, of course. This is our, these are all specific topics to talk about. Anyhow, so to come back to the point, open data is often kind of open sourcing of the government information. 
we have right of information, we also need to know what is leading, what is kind of fueling that information. And this is something that was done in 2013, early 13, uh, by the National Data Sharing and Accessibility Policy, NDSAP, uh, which was drafted by the Department of Science and Technology and was passed and was supposed to govern proactive disclosure as opposed to RTI, which is a reactive disclosure policy. So if somebody asks for the data, it takes it out. NDSAP is supposed to push for a proactive disclosure of government data in digital formats with a focus on open formats and open licensing. Though none of those issues are really uh, clarified in the policy, but that's a separate uh, thing altogether. There's a big other part of open data, and that is something in India I think we haven't started to talk about much yet. But it is, of course, uh, in the radar of certain individuals and certain agencies, which is open data as a commercial resource, as a business. So the fact that government is giving out data about the things it does, for example, say, say um, if the government is publishing data about uh, which which words in Chennai have how much uh, kilometers of uh, drain water piping, that might give someone who is in the business of making drain water pipes a sense of what can be the projection of Chennai municipality of building drain water pipes in the next five years and make a production decision based upon that, right? So that kind of business insights can of course be culled from open government data. This is a very important issue, especially because the data is not only to be used by Indians. And if you think about larger topics, say like um, say availability of uh, mineral resources um, across India, and on, on top of that, say, uh, anyhow, so, okay, let's not get into examples you largely get the idea that data can be a very good commercial resource, as Google and Facebook have uh, uh, exhibited over the years, right? Let me end with the three questions I have. One is, of course, who uses data? I think this is a very uh, important uh, question to think through the lens of gender as well. Who actually has capacities, um, resources, and so on to, to make this data actionable, including the government. I mean, it's not only people who are using it, right? Because a, a big uh, um, argument for open data at the municipality level or at the state level can also come from the union government. Because as many of you may know, union government is always uh, criticizing the state governments and the municipality governments and so on, that they're not sharing the right kind of a right amount of accurate data and so on. So the publishing of data or capturing of data while thinking of these things, let's also think of who would actually use the data and what requires using of the data. And of course, to what purpose that data is used. But the third question is also very important and just to connect back to what Satya already mentioned, is that who is part of the data? I studied economics and in economics there have been, uh, there's this one topic called the national accounting. So the way you count uh, what your country produces. And there are these long debates whether this index called GDP, whether it properly captures what the women in the country produce, um, whether it captures um, necessarily um, any, okay, let's not get into national accounts. Um, the point is, again, very briefly, as Satya mentioned that maybe the poor in the city or maybe the informal city is not captured in the data at all. Um, as Param pointed out, um, that may not necessarily be a bad thing because a lot of people may actually live by the fact that they're not captured in data. Uh, to some extent, uh, there can be certain kind of rights uh, demands that we don't want to be captured, especially when we are doing things online. Maybe we don't want somebody to know all the time what we are doing. So maybe we, we can... So again, to go back and to kind of um, locate the questions in real things, um, we can say that we don't want to be identified to begin with, sure. um, that we don't want a unique identifier following us all the time, 
we can see that it's okay that I have a unique identifier that we ha I have a Aadhaar number. I can live with that. But I get to decide at what point of time I do a transaction with the government using the Aadhaar number and at, one part, at what point of time I don't want to do that. And that can be sort of in the cyber space as well. I can, I can see that, okay, I'm happy with the government capturing this kind of data about myself, but I, need, I want to decide in which database that get, data gets uh, stored at. That can be one kind of argument. Or you can say that it's all fine that you're getting the data, but you have to tell me when you're acting upon it. You have to tell me when you're doing an analysis and taking a call about my world based upon the data I have given you. You have to give me a notice about that. Thanks a lot.